Theory and Philosophy. Take the case of American forensic scientist Frances Lesser Lee and her diorama series entitled Lushal Studies of Unexplained Death, which she painstakingly created by herself in the 1940s and 1950s and are still used today to train investigators in the science of observation and inference making. Now, consider the 1937 diorama Free Room Dwelling. A man, covered in blood, lies face down on the floor on top of covering stick from the bed beside him. A few inches away, a woman lies on the bed as if peacefully asleep, but her face and the sheets covering her are soaked in blood. In an adjacent room, a baby in a crib suffered the same horrendous fate, bloody while cradled by blankets. A teddy bear lies next to an overturned chair. The rest of the house, well lived in and stocked with food, supplies, and appliances, neatly stored away with some things amiss, as is typical in a usual middle class home, are left undisturbed. We ask, who are these people? How are they related? How did they die? Why did they die? And why in such horrible ways? Most importantly, who killed them? Our preoccupation with murder mysteries is reflected in the great number of detective thriller comics, animated and live-action TV shows and films, board and video games, blogs, and web series that have gained popularity across the years. It's always the same theme as Glester Lee's dioramas. Use a crime scene, solve the crime. Identify the motive, figure out the means, capture the culprit, reconstruct the narrative, let justice rule the day. Come to think of it, it's not the mystery itself that so immerses us, but the excitement of putting things together, reconsidering the evidence, setting apart the plausible and implausible, and coming up with a satisfying and reasonable explanation. Out of chaos will bring order, from uncertainty we see clarity. This process of attribution, of looking for causes, is indeed what Fritz Heider and George Kelly meant when we are naive persons as scientists, creating common sense apologies to make sense of the seemingly senseless. That's why theories and philosophical assumptions are important in research. They are equivalent to motives and means. They guide our investigations, shape the process of our research, and identify directions toward our answers. The only difference is that while forensic scientists use explanations and assumptions to speak for the dead, we take our theories and philosophies to give justice to the experiences of the living. We use theories in psychological research to help us make sense of the phenomena we're studying. When we do research, we need to check where we are coming from because our lenses ultimately influence how we view the phenomena we're investigating. We'd be looking at two sets of assumptions that shape our studies, theories and paradigms. Sometimes, when being asked what you think, you might say, I have a theory. Often, you use theory in that context to mean that you have some type of explanation for what's happening, and your definition is not far off. There are many ways to look at it, but theories are generally integrated sets of interrelated assumptions that we use to describe, explain, or predict psychological phenomena. These can be assumptions, propositions, or hypotheses about how variables or constructs relate to or cause each other or they can be formally detailed beliefs about the nature of psychological behaviors. We need to understand what theory we're starting from because, when we use theories as lenses in doing research, they shape how we choose our topic, methods of data collection, analysis, and inference making. At the same time, theories allow us to make sense not only of the study we conducted, but also its implications for society at large. This is especially the case in studies that rely on perspectives such as race conflict theory, Feminist theory, queer theory, or class analysis, all of which are lenses to how our ethnic, class, and gender backgrounds come into play when we plan and analyze studies and are important in empowering participants in our research process. Usually, as we saw in our discussion on the scientific method in the first lesson, theories work in a top down fashion. We want to test or verify a theory, so we derive research questions or hypotheses 
designed a study that tests our operationalization of the theory's assumptions, collect data using rigorous measures and observations, then use the data to either support or refine the theory. This theory data cycle is the deductive approach to how we use theories, which is often the case for quantitative research or when we want to explain a phenomenon using a pre-existing framework. Meanwhile, we can take an inductive route when we develop a theory in the course of doing research or modify it flexibly as our study needs. We proceed in a bottom-up or inductive direction, starting with the data derived from open-ended questions, resulting in narratives and non-numeric information, which are then analyzed for themes, ultimately arriving at general conclusions. This approach is what we'd see in qualitative studies that aim to explore a new or emergent phenomenon, and especially when we deal with complex issues of social justice, inclusion, and representation. In real research contexts, these two approaches work together. Inductive theories build a crucial foundation for further research by exploring the unexplored and exposing the breadth and depth of phenomena previously left unconsidered, but inductive theories take the large body of research by identifying how everything is related to each other. The cycle continues because when we come up with answers, we realize how limited our knowledge is, and so we ask new questions to jumpstart the process. Once we have formally detailed theories in our field, we have to admit that not all of them are equally good. We then ask, what makes a good theory? There are many standards we can hold theories to, but Paul Van Lang gives us four we can start with. And to help us clarify his points, we're going to consider Albert Bandura's social cognitive theory as an example. At the center of Bandura's theory is the notion of human agency. He believes that we're capable of making reasoned decisions and active steps to realize the goals we set our mind on. We also check how far we've gone and reflect on our motives to make sure that we're still on track on the progress we're making. Van Lang's first standard is that good theories are truthful, or at least truth-like. We said in our first lesson that our knowledge is tentative, relying on what we currently know, so we accept that our theories can be wrong or incomplete. However, what evidence we have is still useful, because having greater empirical support for our theory gives us more confidence in its validity or ability to reflect what is really happening in the real world. Most importantly, a theory can only be supported by evidence if it's testable and falsifiable in the first place. What that means is that clear predictions or hypotheses can be derived from the theory, which are then foreseeably researchable in their own right. It's difficult to test predictions like dogs are capable of gaming, because we don't have means, at least at present, to ask what dogs think in a language we can understand. Meanwhile, Bandura's prediction that a person who has high self-efficacy or belief in their ability to do a task successfully is more likely to indeed succeed is quite easy to test. Measure how much people believe in themselves, make them do a task with an objectively measurable outcome, and then see how well they do. Next, good theories have high levels of abstraction. We're able to clarify how constructs, variables, or phenomena fit together. They allow us to see how specific behaviors are actually connected, and we're able to do this using assumptions that are internally consistent or agree with each other. Above all, we're parsimonious, using as few assumptions to make sense of as much as possible or having high explanatory power. You've heard of Murphy's Law, a saying that goes anything that can go wrong will go wrong. A theory with too many moving parts will need to change more things when its parts fail, so we prefer theories that are simple and assume only as much as needed. For example, consider how infants learn language. Language is very complex because it covers not only the sounds we make, but also the rules governing how to put words together, including the shared meanings that allow us to pick up on cues and signs that are not spoken at us but we're expected to infer. For the longest time, one psychological explanation for language development is reward and punishment. If the baby talks in a correct way, the parent or any conversation partner smiles and interacts with the baby more. It's a nice feeling to make other people happy, so the baby talks more. The problem is that this is a long trial and error process. Reinforcement relies on rewarding very specific speech acts, and we don't have enough interaction time to teach babies the entirety of language. At the same time, language has too many parts, but we infer a lot of things inside our heads without saying them out loud, so how do babies learn those? What Mandura proposed is that by communicating with infants, we help them learn through modeling. We first imitate the sounds we make, 
when they begin to pick up on the implicit patterns of language. They learn the complex rules of how we communicate because we point to the environment, we look around, and we orient the baby to the fact that language ultimately refers to things around us. So, Bandura's approach relies on the principle of modeling, which doesn't assume much. This principle is powerful because it applies to any type of learning. When they try to ride a bike, solve a math problem, navigate the world on foot and through public transportation, or develop any other skill, we don't just get rewards by accomplishing the task. We also actively think about what we're doing, we ask around, we observe what others are doing to succeed, and we take these pieces of information to inform our own actions. Next, when theories are true, such that they validly reflect our experiences, they inspire progress in the field by encouraging continuous research, thus promoting theory modification, refinement, and expansion. So, the more that a theory is true, the more studies come in to support its assumptions, and the more that it enables us to understand the world. Social cognitive theory was first developed in the 1960s, initially to explain how violence in media influenced the aggressive behaviors of children. Over the years and up to the present, its central premises and principles have held up to testing and has led to the expansion from modeling and human agency to a full-fledged theory of social learning and functioning. Finally, well-abstracted, internally consistent, and parsimonious theories have greater applicability because they have greater explanatory power. At the same time, they demonstrate relevance to real-life concerns by transforming their assumptions into interventions that are beneficial to society. Bandura's theory has been taken out into the real world through applications in psychology, mass communication, public health, and education. Examples of these are TV shows focused on health-seeking behaviors, HIV prevention, reproductive health and healthy diets, educational interventions to promote motivation and academic achievement, and programs for participative democracy and moral engagement in social issues. Social psychologist Kurt Levine has been attributed for saying that there is nothing more practical than a good theory, and these standards demonstrate this maxim. Theories are important not only for explaining the world, but also for making positive changes within it. The paradigm we use to look at and do research shapes what assumptions we have and what actions we take. The second set of assumptions, paradigms, are perhaps more powerful because they influence not only our research process, but how we fundamentally view the world. Indeed, another name for them is our research worldview, the basic sets of beliefs that guide how we do research, including how we view and develop research problems, frame our research questions, and choose our methods of investigation. They also determine what forms of data we would consider as satisfactory evidence and what conclusions we can and can't draw from our study. What gives them this power are the three components of our research paradigm. Our ontology, our beliefs regarding the nature of social reality, epistemology, what we believe is the best way to approach this reality, and axiology, how we think our values are involved in research. Together, these assumptions determine our methodology, the actual design and process of the research that we do. There are many ways to conceptualize these paradigms, but John Creswell offers us four to start with, which he defined based on what we want to achieve with our research endeavors. And to make these philosophical assumptions more concrete, let's take the phenomenon of Filipino time and the assumption of our perpetual lateness to the test. The first paradigm, post-positivism, derives from the influence of the natural sciences on psychology. In this worldview, we believe that social realities are largely independent from us who study it, but we admit that our biases in choosing topics and limitations in measuring behavior will lead to deviations and errors that ultimately prevent us from describing reality as it is. Indeed, in our efforts to improve our empirical observations by using ever more precise measurements, we hope to reduce psychological behaviors into its basic processes and structures, determine how everything relates to each other, verify and refine our theories of how the world works, and hope that our conclusions approach reality with greater accuracy over time. So why are Filipinos always late? We can do a time and motion study by measuring how much time it takes us to wake up, prepare for the day, head out from our homes, and get to where we need to go. You can give people a survey listing reasons on why Filipinos are late, and ask them if they agree with each one. The point is, lateness and attitudes toward it can be measured. 
Meanwhile, constructivism says that what is real depends on how people perceive and interpret what's happening around them. So, people act based on how they understand their experiences and construe what's causing them to act in the ways they do. Also, though some people may agree on some points thus resulting in similar or convergent answers, which we call intersubjectivity, our personal, social, and historical contexts will more likely lead us down different answers. And that's okay. The point is to understand the complexity of a phenomenon in all of its confusions and contradictions. In the end, these objective perceptions can inspire theory generation by a comprehensive explanation that tries to bind these individual opinions together. Back to our Filipino time example, different people may have different notions on why Filipinos are always late. Some may say that we lack a culture of strict coordinated time. Others might refer to the concept of polysynchronous time, where people flexibly move around their obligations and multitask many things in the same duration. Essentially, you'll encounter answers that don't fit neatly into agreed CD surveys or those that aren't actually reducible into numbers. Working within the same belief in multiple subjectivities, the critical and transformative paradigm believes that research serves social and political goals. How people respond is not only influenced by their own opinions, but also the structures of power and representation present around them. Some forms of thinking are better accepted in society because of privileged positions based on race, class, and gender. So, researchers must adopt a social justice orientation, collaborating with the marginalized and the underserved to truly represent their voices. In other cases, researchers may formalize indigenous knowledge as a legitimate source of scientific theorizing or correct misconceptions brought about by post-colonial perceptions imposed on a culture. Ultimately, these perspectives are change-oriented and emancipatory, recognizing the role of research in social transformation. With this, we can view Filipino time either as individual faults at disciplined timekeeping or as symptomatic of social systems which hinder being on time. People may report inefficiencies in public transport, the lack of financial resources to employ faster yet more expensive forms of moving around, the long unsolved issue of metropolitan traffic due to the privatization of road development, and preference for private transport, among others. What we end up with is a study that connects individual experiences with the social issues which confront citizens and political structures simultaneously. Finally, the pragmatic paradigm, in being focused on solving their research problems to arrive at real-world practices and interventions, adopts any and all of the previous paradigms. It looks at the context and consequences of our behavior. It takes post-positivist, constructivist, and transformative perspectives and integrates them to solve the practical problems of everyday living. It uses both quantitative and qualitative approaches and develops mixed-method studies to approach the research problem with any tool that would best understand and solve it. So, it wishes not only to make sense of Filipino time, but also to solve it. We take into account individual beliefs about timekeeping, while also seeing how physical and structural factors hinder our mobility. It does not dismiss anything as irrelevant or fundamental, because all pieces of information can be useful in fully resolving the problem. Anything goes, if only to meet the goals and purposes of why the research was initiated in the first place. In the end, when we acknowledge our theoretical stance and worldview, we then approach research with a more complete framework. Our studies take the form that they do because of how we explain our behaviors, how we view reality, what we use to study it, and what goals we wish to achieve. This lesson is perhaps the most difficult in this series because we look at the abstract foundations of what makes research possible. We learned about what theories are and how they are developed both deductively and inductively, then determined how to evaluate theories based on standards of truth, abstraction, progress, and applicability. Then, we saw how research paradigms or worldviews shape how we view social reality and what we think is the best way to study them. Finally, by putting all of these together, we now understand how our theoretical and philosophical assumptions shape the methods and processes we use in our research, which is the topic of our next lesson. See you then!